Good evening, everyone. My name is David Cherry Andy, and I'm a writer and professor of English at Simon Fraser University. And I would like to welcome you all to this special event entitled Writing the Stranger's Home. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Katsi, the Coquitlam, the Kwekwe, the Kwantlen, the Semiamu, and the Tuwasin peoples, on whose unceded traditional and ancestral territories the three campuses of SFU occupies. I would also like to speak humbly and personally in expressing my own desire to continue listening to the truths and stories of these lands as voiced by Indigenous peoples. Of course, it is my great pleasure and honor to host this special event, introducing none other than Katerina Vermette as the 2021 Ellen and Warren Tallman Writer in Residence in the Department of English at Simon Fraser University. This Writer in Residence program is made possible through generous support from the Shadbolt Endowment, SFU's Dean of Arts and Social Sciences, SFU's Department of English, and of course, the Ellen and Warren Tolman Endowment. Katerina Vermette is available for one-on-one -on -one consultations with writers during the fall term of 2021. My cat is, is uh, lurking. To book an appointment with Katerina Vermette to discuss your writing, please visit the Department of English website and look at the Writer in Residence tab. So today, uh, or this evening, Katerina Vermette will be in dialogue with Joanne um, Arnott, and this evening promises to be uh, tremendously exciting. Um, I will begin by introducing both Katerina and Joanne, and then inviting Katerina to lead with a brief reading from her new novel, The Strangers, before turning things over to Joanne for the dialogue. Um, after uh, the, uh, the reading and the dialogue, uh, there will be a short uh, Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, that's, um, uh, yes, please use that. Uh, please only use the raise hand function if you require a different form of accessibility. So uh, now let me uh, tell you a little bit about Kateri Vermet, um, if, if this is at all uh, necessary. Um, uh, she is, uh, for me, very sincerely, uh, one of the greatest writers of our generation, uh, or maybe it's your generation. I feel like, uh, I, I feel I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, it's unfair of me to conclude you in my generation. <laughs> um, but um, most sincerely, that is how I, how I, how I feel. Um, and I have a, a, a quite, quite in, extremely abridged uh, bio here uh, that Katerina provided me with that uh, I, I really would love to read, just to give a sense of the, uh, the diversity of her uh, writing uh, practice. Katerina Vermet, uh, pronoun she, her, uh, hers, is a Red River Métis mischief writer from Treaty One territory, the heart of the Métis nation. She has worked in poetry, novels, children's literature, and film. Born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, her father's roots run deep in Saint Boniface, Saint Nubar, and beyond, or Norbe, and beyond. Her mother's side is Mennonite from the Altona and Rosenfeld area, Treaty One. Katerina received the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry for her first book, North End Love Songs, and was published by the Muse, uh, Muses Company. Her novel entitled The Break, House of Anansi, won several awards, including the Amazon First Novel Award and was a bestseller in Canada. And, and that, that sentence there is an understatement, if I've ever heard one, uh, that it's a tremendously important uh, discussed, studied, uh, read novel, um, as, as I'm sure many of you, of you know. Her National Film Board documentary, This River, won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. 
and she holds a Master of Fine Arts from the University of British Columbia. Road Allowance Era, published by Highwater Press, is the final installment of her graphic novel series, A Girl Called Echo, and is listed among CBC's books, 21 Canadian Comics to Watch For in Spring 2021. The Strangers, uh, the, um, published by Hamish Hamilton, uh, a novel, is the follow-up to her award-winning debut novel, The Break, and will include previous characters set in the same world. Katerina lives with her family in a, in a cranky old house within skipping distance of the temperamental Red River. I love that, uh, <laughs> that sentence. Um, I have to say that, um, of course, we're here to, uh, and for uh, a couple of reasons, to celebrate this, this stunning follow-up to the break uh, entitled The Strangers. Um, and I should add that, that The Strangers uh, was recently longlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, um, special, uh, special honor, but by, by no means uh, the, the last honor that this I'm not going to say anything, but <laughs> anything more than that. But it's uh, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a fine honor. But um, I think the the extraordinary honor is that uh, this very day marks the launch date of the strangers, and Katrina is being extremely generous in uh, being with us here today um, on the date of the launch of this highly anticipated uh, follow up to the break. So right now, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Joanne Arnaud. Um, Joanne Arnaud is a poet, uh, essay uh, editor, SAS and arts community organizer originally from Manitoba. And again, if you have lived in the Lower Mainland, you know how much work and how much uh, insight and, and, and may I say it, love that she's given so, uh, generations of writers uh, in this, uh, this part of the world. She has lived in the uh, Lower Mainland for over three decades. She is the mother of six children, all born at home. Her collections of poetry include Wiles of Girlhood, Girlhood which uh, won the Gerald Lampert Award in 1991. Um, other poetry books include My Grass Cradle, 1992, Steepy Mountain Love Poetry, 2004, Mother Time, New and Selected, 2007, a Night for the Lady, 2013, and Halfling, uh, Spring, 2013. She published a children's book with Mary Ann Barkhouse, Ma McDonald, uh, 1991. And her nonfiction works include Breasting the Waves on Writing and Healing, 1995. And in 2017, she received the Vancouver Mayor's Art Award for the body of her work, a very, very, very well-earned uh, award, uh, I, must, I must say. Recent publications include a poetry chapbook, Pensive and Beyond, 2019, and the co-edited volume, Honoring the Strength of Indian Women, Plays, Stories, Poetry, from Vera Manuel, 2019. Joanne is poetry editor for Event Magazine, poetry mentor at the Writer's Studio, SFU, and currently a Shadbolt Fellow at SFU in 2022. So um, please, uh, it's, it's quiet in the room, <laughs> uh, but uh, please uh, join me in, uh, in welcoming both uh, Katerina Vermat and uh, Joanne Arnott for uh, the, this, this evening. I, I believe we begin with the reading by Katerina uh, and, then, and then the dialogue, if I'm not mistaken. All right, here I go. Thank you, David. Um, it's my honor to be here. Um, first, my land acknowledgement, I have to say I am in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1. Um, the Red River is just over over there. I don't know what we're, I, I know it's west for me, I, it's over there. Um, so I always like to acknowledge the water as well as I'm acknowledging the land. So I am here from Treaty 1, my homeland. Um, I'm honored to be with you all all the way over there. Um, past my bedtime, oof, it's like nine o'clock. This is, this is wild, I got a cup of tea. Um, so it is lunch day and I'm, and I'm happy to share this space. Um, typically I historically don't do launches even in, in 
regular times. Um, so I like to kind of share space whenever possible. I'm delighted that Joanne was able to join me today. Um, Joanne, I will also add is one of my oldest mentors on this journey of writing. Uh, Joanne and I met very auspiciously at Brandon University in 2007 where she saved me with a cigarette and a lifelong friendship. And really her work has brought, helped to bring mine out. So I'm honored that she could be here. Help me celebrate this day and this residency, um, which we will also launch today. Um, I'm gonna read from The Strangers. I'm just gonna show you the cover. This is the arc, as my editor has pointed out. I should show the hardcover, but I like to read from paperback. So I'm, I'm still using the arc. And I have to also acknowledge the beautiful artwork. Um, here, this is um, bead, beadwork on birch bark, and it is a piece by my beloved friend Casey Adams, who's a delightful artist um, that I hope you will all look up. And one day I will buy this piece and have it hanging in my house, but she's not ready to let it go. So we're just going to work on that for a little bit. So I am going to read from the book. I'm going to read the the book has four main protagonists and four main stories, and I'm going to read from Cedar's chapter. Cedar is a young girl who is at this time um, meeting her father. She has been in foster care, and she's meeting her father and new stepmother, her father for the first time in her memory. Um, and, you know, because she's discovered that now she's going to go again, change locations on homes again, and go and, uh, and stay with him. Um, I'm going to put these on because I've reached that age. Uh, and it's just so much kinder to read. Um, so this is Cedar's voice as she meets this new couple. They seem nice enough at the start. They're still nice, just different. I met them at the social work office downtown a few weeks after my mom told me what was happening. It was still summer, still too hot, and I still had the same respite worker. I thought mama would be at the meeting too, but she wasn't and no one mentioned it, so I didn't ask. They just took me to the big room with the TV and the couch, and it somehow looked really run down from the last time I was there, like the furniture needed a wash. I felt embarrassed by all of it. They were in there waiting for me, a young looking dark haired put together man, the only gray on the sides of his face made me think he was older. And a nice looking blonde lady with shiny gold rings, earrings and necklace, Sean and Nikki. Nikki stuck out her hand when she was introduced and then pulled it back and blushed like girls do in the movies. The social worker did most of the talking at first. Cedar is going into grade nine, high school, isn't that right, Cedar? I only nodded. I didn't look up much. My dad, Sean, smiled whenever I did and it made me shy. And your daughter is about a year older? The lady, Nikki piped in. Yes, almost exactly. She's gonna be 15. Her birthday is just a few weeks after hers, yours, she turned to me. You can celebrate together if you want. She had deep blue eyes. They were almost gray. And when she smiled, the lines around them twisted. Her makeup glittered under the yellow lights. She even wore lipstick. I could see the line around her lips and it didn't smudge at all. And they have a room for you in their house, the social worker continued as if she was trying to convince me of something like I had a say. It's just a bed and a dresser and a desk right now, Nikki said. I figured you'd want to decorate it however you like and bring your own stuff, good thing. We can go shopping when we get school supplies. You can get whatever you want, really. Nikki took a breath and looked at my dad, at Sean, and said, quiet, I'm so nervous. It's okay to be nervous, Nikki, social worker said. I think that's to be expected. I bet Cedar is nervous too. She smiled over to me. She was nicer than she usually was, more polite. I could tell Nikki and Sean were not like the other parents here or even the foster parents. They looked richer. 
Something in the way they sat there and the way Nikki looked uncomfortable made everything around them look more poor. I didn't know if they were rich or anything, really. It was just a feeling, a too good to be true kind of feeling, a too good to be trusted. Nikki said, we've got everything ready that we can. And Faith, my daughter, is so excited to meet you. She would have come too here really. She would have come too, really wanted to, but we didn't want to, you know, overwhelm you with all of us on the same day. She took my dad, Sean's, hand in hers. We wanted to have more, have a little brother or sister for you, but God decided it wasn't meant to be. But we've, I've always wanted to meet you, Cedar. As soon as I heard, as soon as we heard about everything, we just knew we had to get you somehow, knew we were your real family. Her eyes filled with tears and I was afraid for, for her mascara, that her eyes would run dark and be ruined. Nikki kept talk, talking, stopping only awkwardly to laugh. My daughter is also native, well mixed, Métis I guess, like you, and her dad's from Alberta. He's not um, around, but she's the spitting image of his mom. Thank God she doesn't look a thing like me. So I know, I know what it's like. And well, I married your dad, didn't I? Well, we're a pretty, we're pretty open and diverse, you know. We don't see color in our house. The social worker leaned back and looked like her job was done. And she could relax now. Sean too, my dad, seemed like he usually just let, let Nikki do the talking. I wanted to tell her that that's not what Métis means, that it's not mixed, not like that. But I only looked at my dad, at Sean but tried not to look like I was looking. Did he look like me? Or would it be, did I look like him? You're quiet after Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> Is it just me reading out loud to myself? I don't no, no, no. <laughs> we're all here. We're all listening. We're all here. Oh, yeah. Good. So Thanks. where where should I jump in? I really uh, I really enjoyed this novel. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I also I love the break, uh, and I really enjoyed this one as well. And it starts in such an exciting way. I think I mentioned that to you, right? With the uh, childbirth, right? Just like thrown into it, and all. <laughs> boom. So, and, and as the book develops, you know, there are the, the four voices of, uh, I guess, three generations of women. And uh, they're mainly women's stories, but there are some men who become kind of very fully fledged characters uh, through the stories of the women, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I noticed, which I actually didn't notice until the very last, you know, section of the book, I suddenly realized that the uh, cedar, the person you were reading of just now, is speaking in I, first person, and the others are third person. So I just thought we could just jump in there. Like, what, where did, how did you decide to, to do that? <laughs> um, I, 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 I made that a deliberate choice. I, I naturally, I think, um, write an I. Um, and I think that comes a lot from poetry because I find per poetry is so personal and I do find that everything is kind of, everything's poetry, you know, no matter what I'm writing, it seems to be poetry. Um, so I feel more natural talking in I. Um, I is, but it's very limiting, right? You know, like when you're writing in an I, you don't have the novelty of kind of getting outside that head. You're kind of stuck in the mind of whatever character that is. and. Um, I don't think every character really works with being stuck in their heads, you know, like I, I like a character like Phoenix, like Cedar's sister, who is a character that was in the break um, as well. Uh, she is, she's very elusive in her way. I don't think she would allow me as a writer to write her in an I because I don't think she would trust me to, <laughs> to do that, you know, um, which sounds nuts, but you know, that's what writing is. Um, but Cedar her, is just such an honest, earnest, 
beautiful character. Unabashedly, she is my favorite character person that I've ever made up in my head. I love her to <laughs> death. Um, she is my, like, I know I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but she's my favorite. Um, and she, she was my eye. And I don't know if she, that means she's the protagonist any more than anyone else is because everyone else is in a close third. Um, but she was so honest and she really, she was originally in a third. I was trying to write everybody in a third because I, I try, I always try that. Um, but bringing her into first just really made her come alive because she kind of, she let me get that close to her. Um, and again, she's fictitious. So that sounds crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> but I like, she, she let me get in. And I think she really kind of sung that way because she is a quiet kid on the outside and quiet kids on the outside are kind of hard to, to know unless, but inside those heads, you know, and I'm thinking of every quiet young person I know, and I'm sure you know the same, inside those heads, so many things are happening. Um, so I really appreciated getting, having that closeness with her because mm -hmm. she's smart as a whip and it was really fun to be in her head. I wouldn't say that about most of my characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting too, because Phoenix being a, a strong character from the break. Uh, so this one kind of centers Cedar as, you know, a main character. But uh, so it kind of kept, there's a counterbalance there between those two as the the youngest generation and the uh, you know the speakers of the stories. But I did I did in a lot of ways I identified a lot with Margaret, who's probably the most stern, <laughs> unlovable one of the bunch. <laughs> so that might just be an age thing. I don't know. <laughs> oh, she's curmudgeoning. I, I had a lot of fun with her, with her cause um, she's just ragey and resentful, you know? And we, we have to fight that part of ourselves, but in her, I didn't have to. I just gotta like, let it all out. She's like ragging, rad, like she's complaining about everybody all the time. And, you know, I just let that out. There was no gratitude journal for Margaret. You know, we're right. just, like, we're just giving her. You know, just letting it go. It was very, it was very cleansing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there was one scene that made me think of, you remember uh, Rita Joe? The yes. Mi'kmaq poet? Uh, I remember, you know, being uh, at a talk that she gave and uh, I think she was promoting her memoir. Anyways, she, she told the story about you know, wanting to um, pull her husband into line. And so she grabbed a baseball bat and smashed up his new car. <laughs> so there is a scene, you know, with Margaret where she was clearly operating out of that same. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, angry women and baseball bats. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I find I have really complicated relationships with characters because I like to make them really nuanced. And I mean, Phoenix is by no means like a loving, lovable kind of character. You know, I always say like our status is definitely that old Facebook, it's complicated. That's what I'm, that's what my status with Phoenix is and we're kind of doing the love and hate thing. And I did the same thing with Margaret. I kind of felt like I kind of went back and forth with loving and hating her. I think she definitely does some amazing things like the things she does with the baseball bat, which I'm like, yes, sir. That's <laughs> um, but she's also does really problematic things. Like she's kind of a horrible mom. Mm -hmm. um, and she ha doesn't have an ounce of like, she never lets go. You know, she never lets herself be vulnerable. Um, and she does a lot of, yeah, she really kind of wrecks her kids. And, you know, I kind of hate that too. But yeah, I, I had fun. I had fun with the rage and the baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about philosophy. There's a couple of uh, kind of philosophical points that you bring through that I found very interesting. So one of them, 
I don't know if both of them, but for sure one of them, uh, you know, the character Ben, the storyteller that uh, spends time with Phoenix. Uh, and so he starts talking about, or they start talking about uh, Windable stories and Yugulu stories. Um, so that, that was very uh, interesting to me. I wondered if you wanted to share just a little bit more uh, of your thinking about that uh, in terms of the, uh, I guess, the, you know, the point within the novel is to kind of help Phoenix connect with a larger community, right? With the, uh, well, with those, the traditional story and then the insights that uh, could kind of ground her. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, I um. Well, Ben. I'll explain Ben. Ben okay. is kind of like um. Ben is my homage, homage, however you want to say it. Um, however you say that, I don't know. <laughs> um, to storytellers, like all those storytellers that I've been really blessed to sit beside and hear. Um. And there are so many amazing storytellers that I heard when I when I wrote him, um, and I wanted to share that amazing ability storytellers have of teaching through story and counseling through story because they're they're doing both things. They're very much holding us as they're telling the, this story. You know, it's not just a performance. It's it's literally this conversation with everyone who's around them, right? Um, and, and in there, it, and it's not just like in there, and I, I, and I overly simplify things when you talk about how storytellers work, um, because I don't know how else to say it, and I don't, but in every story, there's a lesson. In every story, there's a morale, and there's something that the storyteller thinks you sh might wanna know. Um, and, they're, and the best storytellers are the ones that know that like intrinsically, you know, because they are you. And I think Ben definitely does that for Phoenix. He's a counselor in the institution. She's in a youth center in lockup and she's in like a, the special unit. So she's basically in isolation for, for much of the novel. Um, but her counselor that she's given is Ben. And Ben is the 60 year old. He's described as the Nishnabe Santa Claus looking guy with this big white beard and these little pinny braids, um, balding head. Um, and he just kind of comes in and just talks to her. And at the time when they meet, um, she's, she's pretty, she's, she's on a lot of like tranquilizers and, um, and a lot of medication just to keep her from erupting because she's a volcano. Um, but he just starts talking to her and eventually through this talking, you know, this constant, you know, um, stream of stories and, and places where he's trying to connect with her, he's, he's bringing her out. He's slowly like a, like a, he's got a rope in there, right? He's bringing mm -hmm. her out because he was her and he tells a little bit about his life story and how he, um, you know, was a troubled youth and came out of that and, and, and went and learned from teachers and learned from other storytellers and really, and now he's giving back and he's um, reaching out to the youth and, and the troubled offenders. He works with offenders. Um, so I really wanted to talk about, I really wanted to show that in, in you know, the small little way I could and that just amazing ability to just that, just talking, just sharing space, eh? Just like um, bringing people out like that is, is it looks miraculous. Like, cause on the outside, it just looks like this, you know, um, this old guy who's just, just like talking on and on and on all about, but everything he says has a meaning and there's a reason for why he's doing that. And it freaking works because eventually like even the most, you know, withdrawn young person and, you know, young people are the best in the world at being withdrawn, right? But even the best, the most withdrawn young person can be drawn out with the right story and with the right person, as long as they believe that person gives a shit. If they can actually do that, then they can come out. And that's what happens between Phoenix and Ben. 
Um, the stories, the Windigo stories, like I wanted to be really careful around that. I love Windigo stories. I could talk forever, but we could talk the whole hour just about Windigo stories, Windigo stories, um, because they're fascinating. It's a fascinating piece of, of teachings and there's a bunch of stories behind them. There's a bunch of like theories around the Windigo and the Windigo uh, about what they actually are. There's a whole mass of, of history, you know, like there's court cases written in Canadian law legal system of Wikigo hunters who were on trial, these people who were designated as the hunters in their community, who were, were their actual job was to go find the Wendigo and the Wikigo um, and, and bring them to justice. And um, there's a whole bunch of stories around that. It's, it's, I love it all. Um, but I also, I, so I wanted to like talk about that but also I have to respect the stories, right? Because so many of these stories, they don't belong to me. They belong, you know, they're teachings and they're, and I didn't want to like, you know, get into places that don't belong to me. So I was really just, so whenever he got into a story, whenever Ben got into a story in the book, there's just this ellipses because mm -hmm. then he, that's when, you know, he's telling something that I don't have permission to, to tell. Um, but I still wanted to like talk about it like as a theory, you know, and as a as a writer, it becomes like a symbol or like a, a metaphor for for who Phoenix is, you know, these um, Windigo, for those who don't know, are, are like cannibals. They're, um, the story goes that they're people who are corrupted in some way and essentially their, their heart gets frozen. Um, so the Windigo hunters, their job is to bring the Windigo home. Um, and often um, one of the healing practices in my part of the world anyway, was to bring them to ceremony. So the idea was to melt the frozen heart. Um, and there's lots of theories behind this think, thinking that these were people were, um, you know, mentally unwell and that's why they were deemed Windigo because they were they were they had lost it and were disconnected from reality um and also like there, there's a whole bunch of stories like I'm not like again you know so right, right. I I love I love all of that and I love thinking about all of that and I was trying to be so careful I don't know if I would I hope I was careful enough um well for me you know as reader uh it was very effective to uh you know, of course, I wanted the stories, but also it's very effective to keep the attention balanced on, you know, the characters and their relationship, right? So, uh, so I thought I thought you handled that very well. Thought it worked well. Oh. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, that's that's a good reason why I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> you can use it. <laughs> yeah, because you know these storytellers, they would just go on. I could write a whole book just about Ben talking because he's a great. He just goes you know, yeah. and um, I heard him so clearly, you know, and uh, yeah, I just, I was like, that was when, you know, when that, you know, when you're just like, you feel like you're just like typing as like, you know, they're, the spirits are talking to you. Like that was, Ben, Ben is that kind of voice where he just like, totally, you just. Well, he seemed to me a very familiar character, somebody that I've, you know, I've met here in the lower mainland and in Manitoba and wherever I've gone. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. I heard, yeah. yeah, sometimes he reminds, he, he reminds me a lot of the Richards, you know, Richard Van Camp, Richard Wagamese. I, I really heard them as I was in, in the cadence of his voice, you know, the way right. they kind of do this. I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing this. <laughs> So did you want to touch just very lightly on the Wugawu? Because that because in the book you kind of contrast those. So Ben identifies as a, you know, with the Wugawu, whereas Phoenix identifies and apparently the author <laughs> identifies <laughs> with the Wendigo. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to use Wendigo for for Phoenix, um, not only because um, you know, she likes them, but also I think it's the Wendigo is a, is a good symbol for her, a metaphor for her, for lack of a better word, because they are that, it is that fierce cannibal. Um, the Rougarou is, I like Rougarou too. Um, <laughs> maybe it depends on the day. You know, I love all these creatures and I wish, 
I knew some people who were these creatures and I could just talk to them and ask them about their lives. So the Ruguru is essentially very similar to a werewolf, um, very similar to a shapeshifter. Um, so shapeshifter into a wolf. Um, a Ruguru, there's lots of different versions of stories, like there are different are versions of Ruguru, like there are versions of werewolves versus shapeshifters and whether or not the change happens in full moon or if it happens um, when sometimes the stories I've heard are when like they get angry kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking for some reason about um, stupid Twilight, you know, like remember they had the wolves, you know, um, I don't remember what happened. They, they got, did they get angry or they got hot or something? I don't remember Twilight. <laughs> Let's forget I said, let's forget I said anything. Okay. Um, but there's, <laughs> there's different versions around the Ruguru, but the Ruguru is more um, generally like there's a control of the change. They still change into a beast, but there is, feels like an implicate to me, and this is just my interpretation. There feels like there's an implication that there's more control over that change where the Wendigo is kind of uncontrollable, you know? I mean, they still like, you know, become creatures that go hunting animals and rip skins apart and, you know, Rukuru, Windigo. Although not, not always. I remember, uh, you know, reading a Rukuru story about a, a cow. And who doesn't love a cow, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I can't imagine it was a, you know, carnivorous cow. <laughs> they didn't mention that in the story. That's true. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, there's also <laughs> shapeshifters of like every creature is supposed to have a shapeshifter, right? There's a, they're supposed to be, this is part of, you know, different animal connections or something like bears. There's a lot of stories about people who turn into bears for whatever reason. Um, and bears are pretty gentle in, in stories. <laughs> except, except when they're not, yeah. Except, when, except in your life. <laughs> So we still got a little more time. Is there anything that you in particular wanted to talk about before we open for q and A? I um. Or do you want to read another five? I could read another five. I could do that for sure. Sorry, I didn't give you time to consider your answer before <laughs> asking a second question. So. Between like reading, okay, I can read. I can read. Let me, um, let me read some curmudgeon Margaret here. Um, I'm going to put my glasses back on. Okay. Yeah, this is, these are just my cheap glasses. I had, I ordered like some nice, beautiful ones and they're not in yet. So, of course. <laughs> but, you know, my baby, like, just like, he literally like takes them and tears them apart. So I'm so glad I didn't have the fancy ones. <laughs> this works better. Um, so I'll read a little, this is the first chapter of, of Margaret. So she's not super grumpy right off the bat. We're going to kind of ease into her grumpiness, but she's in, yeah, curmudgeon -y. That's the word for, for Margaret. I think that's the right word. Um, so this is her first chapter. And the only thing to know about Margaret is her timeline is, is different. Um, so her story takes place um, years before the rest of the character story. So this part of her story takes place in 1999 or so um, when Phoenix was born, which is really obvious because the first sentence is on the day Phoenix was born. Um, so that's, how that's so clear. <laughs> it's so clear. It's so clear. Well, it was really like, um, this is a total aside. I was really having trouble trying to do the separate timelines because I'd never done that before and I wanted to do it right. So I found the way to go is to just make really clear sentences right off the bat. So you know, <laughs> you're <laughs> who knew clear sentences. Definitely. That's not what you do with poetry. <laughs> what is this clarity? <laughs> On the day Phoenix was born, Margaret was working on a new puzzle. The phone rang in late morning. Margaret picked up the receiver and pulled the long cord to the table so she could keep working on it. It was her brother, Toby, who had told her the baby was born. Margaret knew it was coming, but didn't think it would be quite like this. It's here already. Was it quick? Before she caught herself, suddenly anxious. 
Don't think so. Mom went to the hospital yesterday. She told me to call you. Oh, Margaret replied, understanding. They never thought to call her before it was all over and done. You're a grandma, Toby said stupidly, and then coughed out his too long inhale of a cigarette. Oh, Margaret said again, quieter this time, then shook the feelings out of her head and lit her own long menthol slim. She exhaled before she went to speak again, then thought better of it and took another drag instead. You should go see her, Toby choked. You should go, go Margot, go. She'd love to see you. I doubt that, she said. Not sure who he meant, but either way, it was the right answer. She ignored the horrible nickname. No sense getting into that this morning. She looked down at the puzzle. It was a 5,000 piecer of puppies in a basket, golden retrievers in a straw basket with a big golden sun in the background. So every shade of yellow you could think of. It taken her all morning just to do one edge. I'm gonna go down there in a bit. You should come, her brother tried again, like it was something to celebrate. Like a girl that young could ever be a good mother or be ready to be a good mother. Bring Joey and Alex, Uncle Joey and Uncle Alex, Toby let out another rusty laugh followed by a throaty cough. And the boys are in school. Margaret butted out her smoke and thought about lighting another one but stopped herself. She hated chain smoking. And I'm busy today. I gotta start cooking dinner for Sasha in a bit. She heard Toby's disappointment in his phlegmy sigh. I'll go tomorrow, I will she said quick to avert any more of his stupid guilt trip. Okay, okay, that's good, Margogo, that's good. Toby gave one of his soft, annoying chuckles. Can you believe she's a mom? Seems like only yesterday I was pushing her around on that swing in the backyard. Remember how she loved that swing? Margaret scoffed. Toby, Toby had been getting like this for a while, sentimental. They said it happened when you started to lose it. Toby'd been losing it for years, if he ever had it to begin with. Of course I remember Toby. It's a wonder it's still up. Dad put that thing up in the 50s. Could have killed the child with those chains. Nah, Dad knew what he was doing. That thing is still solid to this day. They can put the baby on it. Toby was nothing if not hopeful and dim-witted. Hopeful and dim-witted were usually one and the same. Well, I don't know about that. Margaret picked out another smoke, thankful for the slight change of subject. The porch, too, still straight as an arrow, isn't it? Isn't that something, hey? Remember when Dad and I, Dad and us built that thing? That was oh, such a hot summer. Mmm, was all Margaret replied, all she had to reply. She knew Toby didn't need her to say anything. He only wanted someone to listen. No one ever listened to Toby, except their mother who was obviously too busy to listen today with the new baby and all. He seemed to be getting even slower with age and liked to talk more and more or had less and less friends. Lately, he called Margaret nearly every day just to chat. It was so irritating as she always had something to do. Between him and Sasha and the boys, always on her about something, always wanting to talk her ear off. Mar Margaret never got a moment's peace. Dad sure knew how to build things to last, eh? Margaret made another dismissive sound. She wasn't in the mood for Toby's precious rewrites of their childhood. Listen, Tobe, I gotta get to my ironing. It wasn't a complete lie. Okay, okay, little sis. Just thought you'd wanna know, you know, grandma. She could hear him smiling over the phone. It was so grating. She heard him light another cigarette and cough in her ear before sputtering a Talk to you later. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, bye. She rammed the phone down before he could say anything else, then focused back on all those shades of yellow. Thank you. Thank you. So David, did you want to uh, come back to us? Yes, yes, let me... Um... There we go. Uh, Welcome back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne and Katerina. Um, I feel very, um, very, very grateful and indeed privileged to be able to hear that conversation, uh, obviously between the kind of sort of 
conversation that can only happen among experienced writers, but also writers with such a warm and longstanding relationship. So um, uh, thank you, thank you both. Um, we do have some time for questions right now. And, um, and there is a question up uh, right now, and it's from uh, Steve Cullis. Uh, who, who teaches in the Department of English here. And Steve would like to, uh, here's Steve's question. I would love to hear Katharina's thoughts on the differences between working on poetry and prose. How do you decide it's time to work in one genre or the other? What do you like about the differences between the genres you write in? Such a great uh, question, Steve. Um, uh, as, Yes, as someone who also works between poetry and prose um, uh, in, in both genres, and I guess I could add graphic novels, films. Um, what is it like moving between uh, between genres? Um, I kind of love it. Um, <laughs> I was sheepish at first to kind of go. I thought I had a had to have a lane and I had to stay in there, um, but that's not real. Um, <laughs> I kind of just go where um the story goes and I've been really lucky to stumble into projects um that might be a little out of my comfort zone the documentary was very much out of my comfort zone um the graphic novel was totally new I had no idea what I was doing um but it was so much fun it was so much fun to do that um I do feel and I'm coming in this more and more I used to feel like I went from prose, cause I always worked in prose and poetry and I feel like they were seasonal, you know, like I would spend my winter writing poetry and then I would try my hand at stories in the summer. Um, but now I feel like, I'm, now I'm writing a lot of novels right now. Um, I finished this one and then I went right back into the next or right directly into the next, which I'm writing now and trying desperately to finish. I'm already so late. Um, but I feel like the novels are also poetry. Um, and I also think, I think everything I do is poetry. I think of myself as a poet first and foremost. I think I run everything through poetry. Mm -hmm. um, the graphic novels I wrote as poems to begin with. Mm -hmm. Like I just did like this freehand, it was an awful poem, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it just, it's that, way to just bring in all the images, right? It's such an image heavy genre. I just had to like find all the images first. Um, and I tend to do the same thing with, with story um, I, because I feel like as much as I'm, you know, I'm making these dialogues into like a, you know, this, you know, poem, you know, I feel like every individual like dialogue is like its own little succinct poem. I'm, I'm really looking at image like the way a poet would. I'm always trying to dig and find these little like gems and things. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's not so seasonal. I feel like I'm just trying to insert poetry into everything somehow. Um, I'm most at home with that process. Um, my actual poetry feels really autobiographical. So that's how maybe I distinguish poetry poet and, and poems. You know, poems are these loud, crunchy, I was gonna say punch you in the face, but they're not that violent, but they're really like, <laughs> a poem knows it's a poem and a poem will tell you exactly what to do because it's a poem. Um, stories are a little quieter, I think, but they're still full of poetry. Do you, um, oh, there's there's a hand up actually right now. And um, thank you for that, that response. <laughs> Um, I believe um, um, Margaret Lindley, Margaret Lindley, uh, unless that was a, an accident, can uh, Christine or Rebecca, I think you might have to un allow Margaret to ask the question. Yes, she should be allowed to unmute herself now. Yeah, she has. Okay, well, <laughs> that was actually an accident, but I'll ask. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually had a chance to teach the break um, this past summer to a first year class. And uh, I have to say, um, I was really um, thrown, you know, just taken aback at how many students actually wrote to me. It was a Zoom class. 
And uh, a number of students wrote to me personally to tell me how much they enjoyed it. And uh, I was I was just extremely pleased because they weren't doing that about the other novels <laughs> on the course. <laughs> so it really did make a, a, a huge impression. Um, and so, yeah, maybe I should ask a curmudgeonly Margaret question. <laughs> Why did you choose that name? <laughs> um, no, uh, I guess, uh, you know, about the break, it's like, I'm just wondering, did you do something similar with Strangers? Is it set up similarly um, with the different stories, the way that, like the structure of the novel? Um, well, first of all, thanks for teaching and, you know, the book sales, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you for prep professors for making people buy my books. Um, the strangers is, is different. And I also want to say like, I'm, these are interconnected worlds, um, but they are meant to stand alone. It's a like the only character who continues into the strangers from the break is, is Phoenix. Um, and she's a pretty powerful or big character in both books. Um, but there's, they're meant to function on their own. And I feel like they're like, interconnected worlds even, because they're very different from each other and they're very much their own world. Um, the Strangers is different. The Strangers is, my goal was to make this family saga. I wanted it to rely on stories, I wanted to talk about stories and how we use stories to, to counsel and teach the way Ben does, but also traditionally, um, but also how we in particularly in families, use stories to really know ourselves and know each other and know how we're connected. Um, so many of these characters are incredibly isolated from each other, whether by you know the systems that are in place that oppress us, um, or you know by their own mistakes. Um, but everyone's kind of isolated, but they're still connected. You know, so it's this is a different beat. There's definitely a different rhythm. Um, it's a family story. We're kind of building and digging, we're, we're building up and digging deeper. Yeah, that, that was, that's a good metaphor. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's building this, this story around this family um, and trying to make sense as they make sense of themselves. I mean, the break to me, I, when I think of the break, I think of this, like it was, it was so claustrophobic for me to work in that space. It was incredibly traumatic. Um, because it is about, like, it's all about trauma. They're both about trauma. Everything I write is about trauma, all the time. All, all the trauma, why? I don't know. Trauma, drama, everywhere. Um, but the break is incredibly claustrophobic. It takes place over just a couple of days. It's a bunch of, it's almost like it jumps around to all these different characters and there's no pattern to how it jumps. And that's part of the franticness. Um, the strangers feel so orderly by comparison. It was so much easier to write because I gave myself more time with it. Everyone's in the same order. It's always Phoenix, Cedar, Elsie, and, and Margaret, every, everything. Um, and I just, like, I don't want to say it's slower because then my publisher will say, you make it sound like it's boring. I hope it's not boring. I think there's drama everywhere. I mean, again, we're dealing with trauma so, and, and responses to trauma. So we're constantly dealing with stuff, um, but it's a lot gentler in a lot of ways than the break. The break felt rough. It was so hard for me to, to write. And I think sometimes, I hope it's not as rough to read, um, but this is definitely something different. And we're, we're kind of, uh, yeah, still in the same world, inter still in the same universe, interconnected worlds. So um, yeah, just trying something a little different, hopefully. Or maybe it's more of the same, I don't know. <laughs> Most writers just write the same thing over and over again, don't we? <laughs> I certainly fear that that's my case, but, uh, but I, I do, I do, feel, I not only hear, but also feel, um, feel it when you say that these are two independent books, that yes, there is, a, of course, a, a very big character that does cross over, and, um, and it is, it is a companion, I believe, you know, I would say, uh, those who, who have so 
admired and been you know just kind of overwhelmed by by the by the the story of in in um, in all of the in all kinds of different ways, including very positive ways. Uh, the break, who uh, really must read the strangers. I mean, it's it's just, but I, it does feel like a uh, a very different book uh, with its own logic um, regarding artistic practice. It really feels uh, to to me uh, to me different, and and you know, um, I, I find it extraordinary myself. Um, I um, I have a question. Yeah, there's another question here. I don't have a question. I have a, I'm delighted to see a question from uh, Isabella Wang, who is a student um, at, at SFU, and um, and um, and a, a talented, in fact, a talented and published writer in her in her own respect. Um, I, I must say. And so her question is on the collaboration of forms cross genres. Um, and she says, I loved when you, uh, what you said about the line, uh, uh, or when you said, uh, all my work is poetry. Um, and the way that it is so sim symbiotically embedded in your stories. And this is the question, do you ever find the practices of storytelling, narrative and fiction ever influencing your poetry? So that um, uh, maybe it may be the, um, uh, the uh, a different a different type of influence than the one that you've uh, you've, you've just uh, spoken of. Um, I definitely think it goes backwards as well. You know, as as if we if I think of poetry as being the root for whatever I do, um, I do think that it's now it's not separated from the other forms in any way. Um, the collections that I've made of poetry. Um, and where I seem to feel really comfortable in poetry is when um, I'm trying to also tell a story, maybe through a series of poems, maybe a section of the book, um, maybe something. There's always a narrative thread um, that I hang on to as I go from one to another. Um, as a poet, I also always say, like I tend to grab hold of metaphors um, like in North End Love Songs, it was the birds and the trees and in River Woman, it was, spoiler alert, the river. Um, <laughs> and I just tend to grab onto these little images and I just say like I, and metaphors and I, and I, and I beat them with a stick until they're absolutely spent. Um, because I do, and that's kind of what I do in prose too, though I, I hope it's all interesting, um, or at least a little bit compelling. Um, but I do, I'm kind of obsessed with that. And maybe this is my multiple point of view, why I'm so drawn to multiple point of view novels is I'm so interested in looking around things, like all the way around. It's like, oh, you think something is one way, you look at it in another perspective, yeah. completely different. So powerful with Phoenix in, yeah. Yeah, in, in The Strangers. I, I, I really, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, I love that. No, I love that surround. I love that surround. And I just, um, it, you know, in, in, and it really works for me in, in art um, because I can just dive in. Um, in life, it leads to a lot of overthinking and indecision. But, you know, in art, you can just totally like look around things all the way. And I really like doing that. So definitely in poetry, I think that I love, and I love collections that really tell that story. Um, often it's such an autobiography, like it's not, poetry is naturally autobiographic in, in some way. Well, I mean, all writing is autobiographical really, but poetry just like, you can't help talking about yourself. Um, <laughs> maybe that's just me. <laughs> I guess that's um, um, one thing that uh, I, again, I was really struck with in The Strangers is, uh, is is voice. So if if uh, maybe another way of saying poetry is autobiographical um, is, you know, a, a speaking myself, someone who cannot cannot attempt poetry has not attempted poetry. So what do I know? But uh, but I hear the voice um, uh, powerfully in the strangers and that propelling, and, and it's a kind of it, you know, it's um, yeah, I, I I see that. Um, you know, and I, I hear uh, voice both in your poetry and in um, in the strangers. Um, 
in, in dialogue, but also in, in how, um, how things are described and thought. Um, I hear a voice um, and I, um, yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> lovely, these lovely friends inside my head, okay? all their voices, <laughs> all the voices that came. Um, I often think that oh. sometimes that's how I know I can tell something's a story versus a poem is because poems tend to be, this is my personal thing, that poems tend to be about like me, I'm talking about me, um, and then stories tend to be me attempting to embody someone else you know so like it's someone else's voice um mm -hmm. so basically it's all voices in my head and then there's like this embodiment of other people which is like possession or something so i'm just talking about crazy stuff um <laughs> but, but you know that's how kind of it feels like sometimes right <laughs> well i i um i I think the time is uh, has arrived. In fact, we're a couple of minutes over. Oh. Uh, maybe maybe this might be a, a moment to, to just wrap up. I just want to uh, express my again my uh, sincere thanks to uh, both you, Katerina, and you, uh, Joanne, for uh, this conversation. Um, uh, I want to. Um, um, thank you for for being here again, Katerina, on the launch date of your of your novel. And uh, I want to uh, again uh, invite uh, everyone who is interested to uh, check out the Writer in Residence page at um, uh, on the English Department website for SFU, uh, and, and thereby arrange an appointment with uh, no less than, than Katerina Vermet uh, to uh, discuss your writing and. And there are um, just uh, more information on how that's done in the format just there on the, on the web page. So I think uh, I think that's that's it for uh, for this evening. Uh, many many thanks again, uh, Katharina and Joanne. Um, it's it, it truly is uh, it's a, it's a joy to hear you both in conversation. <laughs>